status of capture that serves the rich corporations and creditors. Debt intensifies the shift by burdening individuals who must take on debt to meet basic needs such as house, housing, health care, and education, but who must also bear the burden of public debt through regressive taxation and the non-taxation of their rich corporations and creditors, as well as austerity. Subjectivation within debt economies draws from the value of personal responsibility central to neoliberal ideology. Neoliberal subjectivity is no longer a matter of homo economicus as entrepreneur. It is a matter of assuming and repaying debt accrued in consumption and shifted onto populations through regressive taxation and austerity. The entrepreneurial subject is necessarily an indebted subject. It can only function as human capital by taking on debt. Indebtedness, however, is a form of abject subjectivity in a post-financial crisis context, according to Lazzarato. In the, the indebted man, to speak of Lazzarato, is a failed neoliberal subject, a failed enterprise. Indebtedness is tantamount to culpability. The indebted man is guilty, bound to the fate of capital by its failures. In Puerto Rico, the debt crisis binds subjects and populations by establishing that they are failed economic agents parasitic on federal handouts. Yet in Puerto Rico, indebtedness is not only the fate of, neoliberal, of failed neoliberal subjects, it is the fate of failed colonial subjects who purportedly affirmed cultural autonomy while reaping the benefits, or purportedly reaping the benefits, of US economic, U.S. economic prosperity with the creation of the Estado Libre Asociado in 1952, the roughly free associated state, or you know, um, sometimes called the Commonwealth, but it's um, an unincorporated territory. As an apparatus of capture, debt is a form of coloniality, I want to argue, to speak with Aníbal Quijano, minimally, Colonialism refers to a form of political juridical subordination. Coloniality, in contrast, refers to the race, gender, class hierarchies produced by a colonial history, but that exceed colonialism as a political juridical project. That debt is a form of coloniality that feeds on Puerto Rico's colonial status becomes clear when we consider the austerity measures or the impact of austerity um, implemented in uh, response to the debt crisis. PROMESA, a United States federal law passed in 2016, institute of, institutes a fiscal control board that intensifies what Jose Atiles calls colonial exceptionality. A logic of exceptionality is expressed in the political economic administration of the unincorporated territory through declarations of states of emergency. The 2006 declaration of fiscal emergency, for example, and perhaps paradigmatically, further developed a political economy based on a strategy of foreign investment through tax exemption. It further developed regressive taxation, austerity, and the issuing of more debt. Now, colonial exceptionality deepens the work of debt as a form of coloniality with the institution of the Fiscal Control Board and its austerity plan. The board is tasked with achieving fiscal responsibility and access to capital markets irrespective of social costs. In addition to heightened patterns of privatization, these include uh, the dismantling of public education and other services that have yet to be defined as essential services and hence protected. The disproportionately, these disproportionately impact populations already navigating precarious conditions in the indebted colony, especially um, racialized and gendered uh, populations. And we'll I'll say more about that later. When we speak of the right to protest, Ariadna Godero writes, we are not speaking of the possibility of reconciliation. There can be no doubt. The gap is insurmountable and precisely our fight demands that we denounce it and open it even further. The justice system is colonial, patriarchal, slow and punishing. The fight against La Junta, the fiscal control board, is anti-colonial, feminist, agile, liberatory. End quote. 
In Puerto Rico, acts of subversive resistance not only denounce the gap between the gap between law, state, capital, and a population that must assume austerity, foreclosures, school closures, tax incentives for creditors and vultures, promesa, and so on. They open the gap even further. Protest involves discomfort, incomodidad. To protest is to dislocate, dislocar. Acts of subversive resistance open the gap even further since they require that a violence that is ubiquitous be perceived, indeed become intelligible. In Ultima Llamada, Guillermo Rebollo Gil examines variations of protests that dislocate, that create discomfort. They are all forms of what he calls pasarse politicamente, roughly a political crossing the line, going beyond the limit, overreaching. Pasarse politicamente is to, he says, overturn the limits of political action to transcend the register of acts and expressions customary and easily accepted by the society at large as reasonable forms of protest to the point of bordering on the ridiculous or the dangerous or the undesirable in some, in all that is difficult to accept even within the opposition itself, end quote. Tebollahil seeks to call attention to the assumption in Puerto Rico that political dispute, irrespective of gravity or urgency, he says, should never turn offensive or violent, unfriendly or rude. Pasarse politicamente, then, is an interruption of the violence of quotidian life, he says, but it's a, an interruption that offends. The point is that it should offend because the objective violence to which it points is, is, is extremely offensive. Pasarse politicamente has the potential to interrupt the bounds of intelligibility by indexing the violence of quotidian life. It is a precarious form of protest, however, given the discomfort that it generates. It is precarious not only because it indexes the race, gender, and class hierarchies on display when acts are deemed unruly, vulgar, violent. It is precarious because, by and large, it fails to appear as an act of protest at all. Reojo Hill calls these precarious, precarious acts hopeful, nevertheless. They're hopeful because they require the transformation of the very framework, framework of sense or network of agreements he says, entramado de entendidos, to be grasped as forms of protest to begin with. So today I'd like to examine Reojo Hill's conception of pasarse politicamente as a form of interruption that ranges the aesthetic, the epistemic, and the political. Because Reojo Hill focuses on the precarious nature of the act itself and emphasizes that it is precisely its uncertainty that makes it hopeful I propose reading his conception in light of Walter Benjamin's notion of an ensetzung, a deposition or an interruption. I suggest recovering Benjaminian interruption articulated in the Critique of Violence via the discussion of shul, guilt, blame, or debt in capitalism as religion. So after a sketch of these concepts, and I'll, I'll go through them with, with some detail, um, I examined Rebojo Hill's account of the 2010-2011 student strike at the University of Puerto Rico and the lessons it carries for forms of protest beyond the university. I'll also consider the 2017 strike and the first manifestation in response to the relief efforts in the context of Hurricane Maria led by La Colectiva Feminista en Construcción. So the economic, political, social, and also environmental catastrophes that Puerto Rico is currently facing proposes or presses us to articulate practices of critique and resistance that move from an economic to a historical understanding of debt. Critique and resistance entail reckoning with historical debts that not only produce financial debts and their impact, but that are debts consummated in financial debt. They entail reckoning with the logic of capture, predation, and extraction of a debt economy and the race gender hierarchies that such logic expresses. Such reckoning seeks the, to reverse the purported powerlessness of the indebted through practices that subvert repayment, resisting moving too quickly to gestures of 
forgiveness, reconciliation, or restitution. Practices are subversive when they distinguish between a logic of collection and a logic of reckoning, between debts to capital and historical debts, between a refusal to pay and assuming historical responsibility. They seize or they try to seize the power to bind that instituted historical debts consummated in financial debts in the first place. To move from an economic to a historical understanding of debt that makes available subversive resistance requires at once tracking the history of debt while dismantling understanding history as debt. Benjamin's critique of guilt history is helpful for specifying the strictures of resistance in this context. Guilt history is a conception of historical causality tied to the, a gen, to the generative sequence by which guilt is incurred. Such sequence binds the debtor to the fate of capital. Key here is the possibility of interrupting any such sequence, that is to say, any such fate. Max Weber argued that capitalism is a religiously conditioned construction. In capitalism as religion, in contrast, Benjamin maintains that capitalism is itself a religious phenomenon. First, capitalism is, he says, pure religious cult, one without theology or dogma. Its religious structure is expressed in the immediacy of meaning. Second, the structure of capitalism expresses a permanent duration, he says. The time of capital follows the strictures of exploitation. It binds subjects and populations to the extraction of value. Third, capitalism is the first case of blaming rather than repenting. Rather than offering or requiring atonement, capitalism, he says, engenders blame. Guilt binds subjects and populations by being a form of subjectivation. Guilt indexes debt, debt indexes guilt. The guilt debt nexus permits no action, no freedom, no liberation, he says. Fourth, the climax of guilt is the conviction of God himself is guilty, he says. Capitalism is not the origin of guilt, but guilty. Guilt turns against itself. So rather than atonement and restitution, I think this means that capitalism destroys material relations, forms of sociality, and modes of subjectivity. What is historically unprecedented about capitalism, Benjamin writes, is that religion is no longer the reform of being, but the, obliter but the obliteration, or its obliteration. This logic of ruination, of the obliteration of being itself, sets strictures for its interruption. It's being capital here. Interruption can neither be from within as reformation, nor from without as renunciation. Reformation fails to accomplish atonement since it can be, since it can only be represented as the dynamic progression of debts in capital, in capitalism. Renunciation fails to accomplish atonement since it cannot avoid having the cult as its cause and speaking the language of the cult. And that's Werner Hamacher. Hamacher argues that, however, this formula of this double exclusion contains a hint. The possibility of liberation from guilt can only be located at the very extreme of guilt, where it is no longer itself yet, yet is nothing other than itself." End quote. This climax is nothing but the exposure of debt, God, or uh, debt uh, or credit, God or capital, to itself. The logic of ruination has the capacity to destroy the guilt debt nexus itself, in other words. So I read this, which is kind of a, a very compressed discussion, as the precarious interruption of the immediacy of meaning the mode of subjectivation and the logic of ruination distinctive of this guilt debt nexus that Benjamin traced in, in capitalism as religion. 
Now, Hamaker argues that we should read this reversal in light of Benjamin's comments on forgiveness. The reversal is an opening to a counter history, he says, that interrupts the temporality of fate. The nothing of this counter history, he writes, Hamaker, is the time, is time itself as the time to come. So the guilt debt nexus eliminates the future. The time of guilt is no experience of time since it, it is the ever identical causation of ever identical guilt. It is a form of binding that forecloses action, in other words. Forgiveness is a cessation of that nexus. It comes from the future rather than moving to the future, according to Hamaker's reading of Benjamin. So forgiveness is of another order. It's not a matter of economic or juridical expiation, retribution, or reconciliation. It's a letting go not only of the bonds, but of the very form of binding distinctive of guilt history. Such interruption is a figure of justice for, for Benjamin. So while Hamaker's turn to forgiveness is very suggestive and generative, I think we should proceed with care. We should not elaborate interruption, um, Benjaminian and Insetsung, abstractly, stressing the temporality of forgiveness rather than the materiality of history. So conceived, it leaves in place material structures that must be dismantled if something else will in fact happen. So I want to argue that as the site of the reversal of guilt, that enigmatic moment in, in Benjamin, the logic of ruination sets concrete strictures for thinking interruption. So I want to read this reversal as dismantling the bonds expressed in financial debt, yet a dismantling that undoes the form of binding generative of such bonds. So instead of a letting go, the reversal is an undoing of history as debt through a reckoning with the history of debts. I think that the critique of violence offers a conception of interruption in these terms. Now here, Benjamin, in the critique of violence, Benjamin examines the violence at the heart of a positing, a setsung, and articulates the critical power of an ensetsung, a depositing or deposition and interruption. The violence of positing is a matter of institution and conservation of the law. So the, the text is about the violence of the law. Positing accounts for what Benjamin calls the mythic violence of the law. It, in, in, it initiates a logic of boundary that binds institution and conservation. Such binding institutes what he calls a mythic order that admits of no future. But such an order is of a tightly knit material, of tightly knit material relations that express the logic of annihilation distinctive of capital. So an ensetsung, a deposition, a depositing, interrupts this logic of the boundary and its order. The challenge here is to think of a pure mediacy beyond a setsung. The effectivity of an ensetsung does not reorganize material conditions within the institution and at the same time conservation of the law. Rather, it unbinds the organization or even disorganization of material conditions under capitalism by resisting the nexus itself. Lacking an end amenable to institution conservation, so the idea is that an end set soon is a subversion of mediation itself. So all law is an institution, an effect of a positing of a set soon. Positing institutes an order, but it also seeks to preserve such an order. The violence of the law is rooted in, its, in this investment in its own conservation, according to Benjamin. Violence is fundamentally lawmaking. It institutes the law, hence more or less stable relations. It does not mediate, but rather posits such an order. Lawmaking is non uh, lawmaking is non-mediate, as Rodolphe Gachet puts it. It does not have its essence in being a means to an end. Now, law preserving violence, in contrast, seeks to conserve ends tied to the instituted order. Benjamin characterizes such an order as imposed by fate. 
The mythic character of the law concerns the way relations are bound within the sphere of fate. So a setsung, a positing, and the very work of positing of the law institutes a boundary between the law and what it is not. And such a boundary is a form of binding. It binds the initially non-mediated violence of lawmaking to the mediated violence of law preserving. So the positing of an order, of a legal order, but it's then tied to the, its own conservation, an interest in conserving that order. The purported purity of lawmaking is not maintained as its positing binds it to the ends of the law preserving violence. So Hamaka reads Benjamin's conception of an ensetsung, uh, an interruption that he, he develops in the context of, of thinking about the law and, and the, the, the paradoxes of positing at the heart of the law. Ham, Hamaka reads this as, an, as he calls affirmation. He reads Benjamin's essay as developing a politics of what he calls pure mediacy. The purity of the pure mediacy can be understood in terms of the means and relation. Politics is pure when it does not serve ends situated outside of the sphere of mediacy. Means are pure when they do not follow the order of posited norms. A politics of pure mediacy is thus that which neither preserves nor mandates a certain way of life. It, in fact, interrupts it. Crucial here is the purity of politics. It, sorry, crucial here is not the purity of politics, but that it is a pure mediacy. Hamaker argues that mediacy is the field of affirmation. Affirmation is the condition for any instrumental performative violence and at the same time a condition which suspends their fulfillment in principle. As such, affirmation is a condition for something to happen. Now here, such happening is not conceived abstractly as in forgiveness. Affirmation allows something to happen in the sense that, and I quote Hamaker, first, they let this thing enter into the realm of positings for which themselves are excluded, and second, they are not what shows up in the realm of positing so that the field, um, so that the field of phenomenality as a field of positive manifestation can only indicate the effects of the affirmative as ellipses, pauses, interruptions, displacements, but can never, con uh, but can never contain or include them, end quote. As affirmation, then, in setsung or a deposition is not a negation it does not take cue from a logic of fate that interrupts. Yet it is not an exit from material reality, material historical reality. It is located within what Benjamin called the mythic order. However, in its quality of being unmediated, it cannot appear within it. There is no certainty when pure violence was actually in any given case, as Benjamin. So this is very abstract. Um, so Benjamin's examples in this text, his discussion of the proletarian strike is most relevant. Following Sorel, he distinguishes between the political general strike and the general proletarian strike. The political strike causes only an external modification of labor conditions, he says. The political strike, um, sorry, it merely inverts relations of domination. It preserves state violence and the legal order tied to it. Hence, he says, it's violent. The general proletarian strike, in contrast, is pure means, he says. It takes place, he writes, Benjamin writes, in the determination to resume a wholly transformed work. The proletarian strike is therefore nonviolent, he says. It interrupts the violence of capital as well as the complicity of law and the state with that violence. Crucial here is the distinction between a mere modification of working conditions and wholly transformed work. While the political strike accepts the term state uh, set by the ends of capitalism, the proletarian general strike questions the very structure articulated by those ends. It discloses capitalism as the locus of violence. The proletarian strike is not a negation of the term set by capital, it interrupts by exceeding its demands, by going beyond the institution. 
This excess discloses the institution's complicity in domination. The demands are concrete, although they are not goal-directed. They seek to dismantle structures of domination without offering an image of the state of affairs to be put in its place. The general proletarian strike subverts mediation itself then by turning a form of protest aimed at negotiation, the strike, against the possibility of meeting any demands within the bounds of the institution itself. So an ensetsum is an interruption without certainty, if you recall. It, it, occurs, so it, an inter, it occurs only within the sphere of mediacy, but it cannot appear within it. It interrupts the violence necessary to the sphere of fate, so the material relations that are bound together in such a way that no action and no future is possible. Um, but its effectivity might not be apparent or even realized. Wholly transform work remains to come. Now, while Benjamin calls the proletarian strike nonviolent, it is a figure, he says, of divine violence. It is justifiable to call this violence too annihilating, but only relatively with regards to good, right, life, and such like, never absolutely with the regard to the soul of the living." End quote. The distinction that Benjamin makes here does not secure interruption or its meaning. The proletarian strike obstructs the activity of binding that articulates the complicity, law, state, and capital, but it cannot secure its normative stability for itself. Its nonviolence may in fact appear as violence. Its investment in the soul of the living might appear as an attack on it. So this is where the question of intelligibility um, takes root. The 2010 and 2011 strike at the University of Puerto Rico responded to then Governor Luis Fortuño's austerity plan. In 2009, Fortuño declared a state of fiscal emergency. 26,000 government workers were laid off. Bargaining rights and social protections for public employees were suspended. Privatization was intensified. Substantive budget cuts to the university were announced. The strike occurred in two phases. From April to June 2010, students shut down the University of Puerto Rico campuses. From December 10 to March 2011, the police besieged the UPR campus in Rio Piedras, breaking the university's non-confrontation policy. Artistic demonstrations, forms of political horizontalism, and the creation of an autonomous media characterized the first phase. Alliances with the environmental, LGBTQ, and pro-independence movements were consolidated. The strike had the public support. The second phase, responded to the government's attempt to undermine the UPR's internal governance and bargaining agreements with students. A two-day strike was planned for December 7th and 8th through 8th, but security guards removed gates at the UPR Rio Piedras campus to prevent student shutdown. Court, state, and police actions against students were varied, but they included restriction of entry and exit for food delivery, criminalization and prosecution of student strikers, legal and discursive strategies that presented students as consumers rather than workers, thereby delegitimizing striking as an appropriate mode of political opposition. Students shut down the campus, threw smoke bombs and rocks, wore hoods and masks. The strike was criticized by the public and deemed a failure. The, sec the second part. Although the figure fluctuated, the Fiscal Control Board uh, announced in April of 2017, and well, this has been intensified now, that the UPR system would suffer a 40, $450 million budget cut, which would entail closing campuses and programs, a tuition hike, and the elimination of tuition waivers. Cerrar para abrir, to close in order to open, was one of the main slogans of the 2017 strike. Shutting down operations aimed to create time and space for reflection on the debt crisis and its impact on public education. From its inception, the demands exceeded the institution, the university, that the strike paralyzed. In addition to resisting austerity and the further neoliberalization of the university, 
The strike was articulated around the demand to audit the debt, contest debt repayment, and oppose the precarization of public education in general. It drew from the horizontalism of the 2010 strike, but protested the non-democratic governing structure imposed by the U.S. Congress, La Junta, the, the Fiscal Control Board. Its claims addressed not only the UPR, the University of Puerto Rico, or Puerto Rico's government, but the Fiscal Control Board itself. While many saw the strike, the 2017 strike, as the first bastion of resistance to the imposition of the Fiscal Control Board and its austerity measures, Others saw it as a failure that culminated in costly property damages to the university and symbolic damages to the resistance. If a strike is already an awkward mode of resistance for students who are not workers, critics argued, striking to resist the fiscal control board was simply a category mistake. In addition to organizing symposia on neoliberalism, debt, urbanism, and democracy at the gates, The students organize activities that address issues relevant to the LGBTQ community and so on. They also interrupted a meeting of the UPR's Board of Trustees um, and, um, and made them uh, sign a document that purported to establish support for a debt audit and the rejection of budget cuts. The students were accused of vandalizing campuses. Despite the mis mixed reception, the Fiscal Control Board granted the student movement um, a meeting in April of that year. So, Guillén Marajoyo Gil discusses the 2010-2011 strike under the heading fracasos, failures. Collective memory, he says, distinguishes between the strike's two faces, and here again, thinking about the 2010-2011 strike, um, not according to the shutdown, Rather, people remember each face according to the tactics the students employed. Above all, those used in confrontations with agents of public order, he writes. People recall the first phase of the strike, the creative strike, in terms of artistic interventions and the affectionate contact between the striking student body and various sectors of society. It was, it was a successful rational understanding that moved a country that seemed to be asleep, he says. The creative strike, the first part, offered a new image of the student striker, historically seen as unruly, but now seen as an innovators of horizontal forms of political organization. Cordiality and courtesy were thereby reified as the only appropriate means of contestation, according to Reolgin. The second phase, in contrast, was deemed a failure precisely because of its scenes of, he writes, violence, discontent, frustration, lack of control, end quote. Smoke bombs, damaged property, covered faces sullied the newly cleansed image of the student protester, losing the general public's support. As Marisol Lebron and Giovanni Roberto highlight, The second phase was also deemed violent through race, gender, class markers. Confrontations with young black men from Loisa and Carolina, predominantly poor black towns, hired and deployed to subdue the students, fed an image of violence, disorder, lack of control. The tactic students employed, it was argued, com compromised the very project of resistance that had gained traction during the first phase of the strike. Reojo Hill questions the view that the second phase was a failure. The second phase was deemed a failure because the students, he writes, crossed the line. They overact, overreacted, acted poorly, incurred in practices contrary to the interests of the groups and the ideals they were supposed to represent, end quote. He contrasts the second phase of the strike not to the first, but to occupy Puerto Rico. Among other things, he reflects on instances in which Occupy collaborated with authorities in planning and executing protests. Occupy was not a political force in the archipelago, although they were seen as unruly. Their unruliness, however, was tied to trash left at the campsite. The student strikers, in contrast, renounced cooperation with authorities, responding to, yet thereby amplifying the violence of capital, law, and the state within and beyond the institution. 
That overdoing, that violent excess, Tewoyo Hill argues, offensive, and I'm quoting him, offensive, wrong, alarming, within the context of protest, makes possible a clear, dynamic, and risky image of opposition, which in turn serves as a starting point for critical reflection and to make adjustments to our methods and manners on the way." End quote. The second strike was thus an, he says, inspiring failure. In a chapter entitled, Agua Fiestas, Killjoys, Tewajo Hill, and he's here thinking of Sara Ahmed, Tewajo Hill examines modes of political opposition in Puerto Rico that defy the traditional scenes, either because the claims are not easily comprehended by the public, he writes, or they are enacted by subjects that are not recognized as political actors. He begins the chapter by arguing that to protest is anything that has hope. Following Bernard Tort, he argues that because the subject who protests, who protests cannot control the meaning of her act, because it is a matter of the public's uptake, there is a deficit of meaning when they follow a script that is well known by the public, he writes. Even if a protest disturbs the flow of quotidian life, like disturbing traffic, it is not hopeful if it does not interrupt the bounds of sense of the community. So the very perception of um, at work in quotidian life. Protests are only hopeful, Reojo Hill writes, when their claims result incomprehensible, thus impossible to address without, and this is the important point, transforming the very tr framework of sense in a community. The repetition of forms of protest without major disturbances throughout time, he adds, can even be proof of the stability of the prevailing order. He goes as far as saying that traditional protests in Puerto Rico have ceased to be insofar as they lack hope. For Reojo Hill, interruption requires grasping acts of protestation, he says, especially when what the subject of protest does seems extreme or unpleasant or capricious, and it is done in an inadequate place, in an inadequate time, which could be understood as too much stupidity or irresponsibility on the part of the agent to be cataloged as a clear manifestation of political opposition, end quote. The precarious nature of such acts, to be sure, is due to the precarious nature of racialized and gendered individuals protesting, especially black and brown women living in poverty. However, they are precarious because they defy the bounds of sense, yet they thereby have the capacity to break such bounds. They potentially interrupt their logic and its order. These acts amplify the violence to which they are responding, but they thereby have the potential to contest it. They contest ubiquitous forms of oppression from within. They do so without a name. Precisely because they amplify the conditions to which they are responding, they cannot secure their own, their own appearance or even their normative stability. Teoja Hill discusses three precarious acts of protest, and I want to examine or consider the following two. First, a 2013 tweet perceived as a threat to then Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla. The tweet vented frustration about withheld tax refunds. The author of the tweet was incarcerated for six months. The tweet was not intended as a mode of political opposition. No political group defended its author. Yet the incarceration of this individual should make us pause, Tewajo Hill suggests. In Puerto Rico, those who attempt to address systemic inequality as a public problem are punished and censored. The tweet should be read in light of the systemic, he says, invisibilization and disappearance of a sector, young, male, predominantly black and poor, end quote. The subject that speaks is a subject traversed by race, race gender, class, and as a result, marked as a subject of violence. The point is that this subject is only is allowed to appear as a subject of violence if he does not articulate such violence as the, he says, direct result of a social system. 
The question that we must ask then, the question that might turn venting on Twitter into a, an act of political opposition, perhaps even a hopeful act, is as follows, and I quote Hewayahi. Exactly how should we expect these young people to articulate their claims if not through the discursive codes that they manage in their quotidian life, in all its crassness? To demand a different discursive register is to insist on their invisibility. Seen as such, of course the tweet should offend, because the objective violence to which it points is extremely offensive." End quote. The man's vent was turned into an act of violence, violence itself individualized. He indexed himself as suspicious, dangerous, and violent, in indexing the violence of indebted life in the colony. Consider second the exit interview of a woman who attended the tra la tradicional fiesta de los días de reyes um, uh, in January 2013. In this event, low-income children collect Christmas gifts. These children are asked to draw something in return. The woman was asked to reflect on her day and, to, and the present her daughter received. She seemed unhappy with the event, in particular with the gift. Un trapo de bola, a lousy ball. In the media and within social media, the woman was said to be ungrateful and a bad mother, guilty of imparting the wrong values to her daughter. Hewajo Hill reminds us that the, this event, the tradicional Fiesta de los Días de Reyes, uh, it's a Three Kings Day um, celebration, is part of what is seen as the culture of el mantengo, the welfare. With it, the government attempts to instill the value of work and responsibility, not only gifting educational presents, but turning the gift into payment for something accomplished, the drawing. Reojo Hill writes, el trapo de bola, the lousy ball, became the metaphor for a loose life, el una cotidianidad al garete. A life lived poorly in thousands of homes throughout the island. That is to say, the critique the woman launched to the event was redirected, transformed into an allegation of culpability. It was not a lousy ball, but a lousy mother with a lousy life offering her child a lousy upbringing, and, who, and just who does that lousy woman think she is to complain? In this way, the, her expression became the principal reason for not recognizing at all her right to speech, end quote. The woman's complaint was turned into her guilt, pover, poverty individualized. She indexed herself as guilty in indexing the guilt of a political economy that induces poverty. In both cases, Reo de Gil argues, the subjects are killjoys, agua fiestas, Se pasan. They cross the line from the get-go. They are an uncivilized excess. They can only be read as dead weight, he says. They are scapegoats. As protesters, they inhabit the most vulnerable of positions. They are not students or workers, readables as productive members of society. They do not redeem productivity. They are failed neoliberal and colonial subjects. They protest their protest is incomprehensible, hence they are punished or silenced. But these are protests perhaps in the most proper sense, Reo Hill argues. They are hopeful. They interrupt everyday life because they kill the joy of our ideological fiesta, he says. They protest despite obstacles and from the least adequate space without organizations or committees or signs. Nevertheless, they are protesting. In most of these cases, however, the protests did not appear as such. The offensive violence that they put on display is turned against them. They appear not as figures of hope, but figures of violence. They index systemic violence, yet they index themselves as violent. We might say that these acts of protest are fi these uh, these acts of protest are figures of a Benjaminian Entsetzung deposition, interruption. They are the condition for the disclosure of violence, hence for something else to happen. 
but for violence as well. They have the power to destroy, but they can also be folded into the logic of preservation. They have the capacity to interrupt the time of capital, but they can also fail to be actions at all, further binding these individuals to the fate of capital. I want to consider a third example. A week and a half after Hurricane Maria, La Colectiva Feminista en Construcción, a feminist inter an intersectional feminist um, collective, protest protested in front of the convention center in San Juan, headquarters for the intergovernmental recovery effort. They denounced inefficient rescue efforts, the militarization of those efforts in the moment, uh, or at the moment, and the growing humanitarian crisis. They argued that this catastrophe is their, their slogan was not natural. They denounced poverty, environmental racism, and increased discourse favoring privatization in the context of uh, the hurricane. Maria laid bare not only the erosion of any democratic control of an unincorporated territory managed by a fiscal control board and at that moment the US uh, military. It further clarified inequalities that run along race gender lines, already made evident by the debt crisis. Response within social media was unrelenting. These women were deemed ridiculous, privileged, lazy, obstructive, inappropriate. They called for political reflection when people were struggling to find water, food, gas. For La Colectiva, that was the moment for political articulation, nonetheless. That was the moment to grasp the catastrophe as political rather than natural. Instead of figures of what is to come, they articulated a material praxis there and then. Protests that cross the line, que se pasan, interrupt the materiality of the guilt debt nexus. They have the capacity to interrupt the forms of binding that reproduce colonial debts by generating new modalities of capture. They interrupt the materiality of the guilt that nexus by subverting repayment, protesting the ways in which subjects of violence appear as, or subjects of, uh, within the indebted colony appear as culpable. Though they lack certainty, protests that cross the line do not let go as in the figure of forgiveness. They are not abstract claims about what is to come. They might fail, but they protest. They might not come to fruition in a wholly modified life, but they have the capacity to interrupt the guilt debt nexus here and now. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm curious how this logic can be applied to student debt, um, because that is what is most applicable to me as an individual, but I don't really think that it's um, something that has garnered protest and community around, like, group struggle around it yet. So, yeah, I just wanted to hear yeah, your thoughts. This is, it's a very good question, and um, so, so two things uh, come to mind. First is that um, Fred Moten's um, uh, The Undercommons and um, his account of uh, debt um, is, is very interesting in this context because he, he really argues kind of against an understanding of critique in the context of of, of debt, but rather certain practices. So of study, for example. So certain practices that one can um, 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 perform to, in a way, occupy the spaces within the universities themselves um, that are not commodified. What's interesting there is that he sees those as collective practices. Mm -hmm. There are ways in which the undercommons um, um, come together and, um, and are able to 
actually engage and think and create and do something other than um, you know rep reproduce um, the strictures of uh, not just what is not not just what is being generated by um, the commodification of education, but um, but what is how the how that actually transforms the very what happens in a classroom. Now, what is interesting there is that, um, and this is the second thing I wanted to point out, is that um, something about the examples that I quoted highlight the individual. So highlight the ways in which individuals index a systemic failure. And so the ways in which they appear as culpable, but they appear as culpable um, because we don't, have the right perceptual capacities to understand that it's actually a failure of a system and not the individual. And I think that that applies quite, quite mm -hmm. like, uh, substantively to, to student debt. Um, but, but I like, you know, so the, I transition and I, this is uh, Ramon Rivera Cervera um, in, in a response to this text was telling me, well, you're, in a way, the third example with the La Colectiva Feminist in Construcción in the context of Maria, you're moving from kind of this individual uh, focus on the individual to a collective um, that is actually intervening in, in a more political, straightforward way, even though they appear as completely inappropriate. Um, so, 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 so I think that with student debt and with Moton, you have kind of, you know, you have both the, the ways in which individual students are made responsible for their own education and also saddled with debt that then makes them seem as um, unsuccessful mm -hmm. as failed neoliberal good economic subjects. Um, and, um, but, but he also talks about forms of occupying that space of the university um, collectively. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on it? That's great. I just think it makes a lot of sense. The neoliberal colonial, coloniality of it. Um, yeah. Okay, question. Thanks. I, I don't engage. Um, I was I was telling Joanne before that I, I taught. Uh, I was teaching a class on debt, and this is very much part of it. And it's generative resources. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I love the thinking, uh, the f continual reframing of um, it's not that protests are the things that are violent, but it's the forces that are around us that are violent that are creating the need for protests. And um, it's, I think the points you raised about creating these interruptions and that those interruptions and the more I mean, I guess you're citing other people's ideas as well, but the, um, that those, if those interruptions are created in such a way that they sort of suspend uh, an, a graspability to them, that then it um, gets public support. But I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is if things then become, like, is the moment in which change can happen the moment when we've, suspended belief in 
or 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 not um, cannot understand the protest in terms of the way it operates generally, like in using artistic uh, different formats. Um, because what I understood you saying is once the the public that may or may not be on board yet starts to understand it and categorize it, then it becomes um, easy to write off. And so as someone who like thinks strategically around activism, but then how do you get, how, how do you bring more people yeah. on board to that thing, but then does it then become the everyday and then is it like a yeah. cycle? That's why I got interested in these set of texts because um, so, so now we're seeing this resurgence of the strike at a mass. Um, we have very important ways of um, very important teachers striking, the women strike. Um, for Puerto Rico, there's, you know, for example, the student strikes at the University of Puerto Rico are kind of a historical institution. not want it to just be a script where sure we all go and march and um, and there's a there's a really important moment of a gathering and a visibility of bodies on the street um, and at the same time if it becomes that space where we do that um, then there's a real challenge as to whether that is actually interrupting um, or or voicing I think that what he's pressing is that. He doesn't give us answers, but he's pressing at the problem. And I think that I think that it's, you know, I don't explore it enough here because I'm trying to think about what the, how is the problem framed. Um, but I think it has a lot to do with things that are, you know, beyond conceptual. They're perceptual, and it has to do with visual culture and artistic practices and forms of appearing in public. There are real questions about how do we kind of um, um, yeah, break scripts, the scripted, and at the same time generate scripts that make visible systemic forms of violence. So I think that that's you know like an uncircumventable problem. And the resistance that happens from people looking at people that have taken the time out of their lives to disrupt. Right. I mean, I think we come, that happens in Portland some sort of like, yeah. why are people you know, doing this thing? And I mean, I guess I just started thinking about like the person that gets angry that their car is sitting in traffic and they're not moving. Um, and the, it's important that that person be on board potentially with what's happening, but then like that we're talking about systemic structures that the people, you know, like some people may understand. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, but just. Yeah, isn't that like 
part of like what critical art ensemble tries to address in electronic civil disobedience too. Like the idea that like onlineness is a different way of interrupting people's lives. You're like you're not going to make somebody late uh, to pick up their child from childcare if you take down uh, Amazon or something. Um, and that there's like, these different types of right. uh, disruptions that can occur. Um, I was curious, um, I really like the, the statement of like the possible clue to liberation from guilt is at the extreme ends of guilt and the notion of uh, a political subject indexing themselves as guilty. Um, I was wondering if that would be useful uh, to bring in like Frantz Fanon, uh, the kind of the embracing of black identity as the jump start and kind of overpass the master-slave dialectic. Um, could then guilty be kind of like the, the embraced identity in that way? And also, um, how might this, how might a new identity or lack thereof be formed if, like, we're embracing the, the identity of guilty? Because that might not be politically viable at, at a certain point. Because that might just be kind of replicating the same kind of political theolo theology of neoliberalism at a certain point. But mm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. Um, yeah, and I think that that's. Um, if so, so we were talking about that cut out a little bit of, ago, and you know the, the the refusal to work, for example. So the the refusal or the af the affirmation of non productivity. So the idea of turning against um, or or not, yeah, the, of resisting somehow any type of, um, of um, response by kind of being folded back into the logic of productivity. Um, and so that might, that, those are ways, I mean, it's tricky because, it, so the way that I talk about it here and in the book is that there is, that culpability functions as a way, so it's not, Debt not only functions as a, an apparatus of capture, um, but it also, um, it's a mode of subjectivation, but it's a mode of producing an abject subject that is then, you know, made, made to pay. And so I think that a lot of, um, when I think through this issue in particular, I don't think of embracing an identity. I think about practices of subverting that type of move. And so in Puerto Rico, for example, there are debates about um, you know, questions of debt repayment and also around the debt audit. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting work and a lot of activism. Um, and you can see it in also slogans and street art and where, where there's a way in which it's the, the subversion of the logic of repayment. So rather than, um, so we are indexed as culpable and therefore, you know, the debtors that must pay in the context of, you know, debt restructuring and the distinction between the creditor and the debtor. Um, and many of, of activists that have been doing quite a bit, very, very interesting work for some years now want to subvert that by saying, no, no, you're the culpables. We're, we're the creditors. Um, you owe us. And so, so the language is that the time has come, in fact, because of this financial debt, to track historical debts, colonial debts, and to flip on its head that logic of repayment. So. So rather than identifying with a specific identity, occupying that space of, that, is, that is actually generated by the very strictures of repayment. Um, there's also a lot of debate about the debt audit. So there's a very important work being done around a citizen debt audit. And at the same time, there's some 
other uh, kind of perhaps more radical folks that say we shouldn't audit the debt because that in a way is an admission of, um, uh, of, of the legitimacy of this whole, um, of, of this, this way in which not only um, there has been, debt has been used as a mechanism or an apparatus of capture, but also as a continuation and intensification of the colonial condition. And therefore, it shouldn't be audited in or, it shouldn't be audited and it shouldn't be thought of as an occasion for cancellation of the debt. It should be not paid in full. But of course, I mean, these are important debates, but the realities of these debates are, you know, the, the kind of the political realities, you know, um, are, are very real. <laughs> um, while all of this is going on, there is a fiscal control board and a, there's a bankruptcy uh, process underway. There are austerity measures being implemented and that is very real for communities that are being dismantled, displaced, massive expulsion and migration out of the archipelago. Um, so, so yeah. So in short, I wouldn't, I, I love the connection with Fanon and I work with Fanon in another part of the project, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go the route of identifying with an identity, more the route of how do we, uh, you know, how do we subvert the space that is actually generated by debt itself. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? so much for the questions too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. These are amazing questions. I love yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for very <laughs> questions. Absolutely. Yeah.